Hi, I'm Babs Wagner, and I'm the orchid grower here at the garden, and I've been here now for over 25 years taking care of this incredible collection. Our collection is actually grown in three different greenhouses, three climate-controlled greenhouses, cool, intermediate, and warm, and we have orchids from all over the world in these greenhouses. Uh, historically, the collection dates all the way back to the 1800s, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in the meantime, I just want to show you some bits and pieces, uh, some of the highlights of our collection that are blooming, and maybe some that aren't even in bloom yet. What you see on this bench behind me are orchids from the genus Angracum. And the Angracum are a really specialized group of or orchids from Madagascar. This orchid right next to me is commonly referred to as Darwin's orchid. And the reason it's called Darwin's orchid is because Darwin actually describes the pollinator for this species, which is Angracum sesquipedale. He describes it in his book, Origin of Species, and he talks about a moth that had to have had a really long proboscis in order to pollinate the flower. That moth hadn't been discovered when he described the orchid, and shortly after his description, lo and behold, the moth was discovered. So ever since then, it's always been known as Darwin's orchid. These are all pollinated by moths. They're fragrant at night. Um, it's really a delight to come in here early on a morning and smell the angracums in bloom. These that you see here now, most of them have been in bloom now since early November. So they last a really long time. And they all have a characteristic spur. And the moth has to get its proboscis down to the bottom of that spur in order to pollinate the flower. I'm standing in front of Vanilla Planifolia. A lot of people don't realize that vanilla comes from an orchid. Uh, the garden is proud to have about 16 different species of vanilla. And they usually bloom for us in summer and winter. And in, in the wild, they are vines, and they will vine 70, 80 feet up into a tree canopy, and it's when they go back down, when gravity takes them down, that is when they start to flower. The flowers only last one day, but you'll have sequential blooming, so the bloom period will go on for a while. They all have to be pollinated by hand because the bee that pollinates them is not native to where they grow naturally, and the whole process of pollinating, uh, the ripening pods, harvesting, curing is, is really lengthy. And so that gives you an idea of why vanilla is so expensive. Behind me is Chromatophyllum speciosum. This orchid is one of the largest orchids in the world. They can grow up to the size of a ton a small elephant, if you will. The one behind me, you can see how large it is. This was acquired by the garden in 1989, and I have yet to see it flower. Apparently they have to get really, really big in order to flower. Orchids are either epiphytic or they're terrestrial. Epiphytic orchids, grow in trees or on branches or on tree trunks. Terrestrial orchids grow in the ground. What we have here are some epiphytic orchids that don't grow well in pots, and so we mount them on pieces of cork. Cork is a re renewable resource. The cork tree will regrow its bark, its cork bark, in seven years, and they can strip the tree from it with its bark for seven times and then they have to stop and then it becomes detrimental to the tree. But the reason we like to use it to mount orchids is because the epiphytic roots love to cling to the cork because of the nooks and crannies. 
And so that is why we mount orchids on cork. This particular orchid, Brassavola nodosa, is, has a wonderful nickname of Lady of the Night. And that's because it's phototropic, meaning that it is only fragrant when it's dark. So if you have this orchid growing in your home and you have it in a dark room, you can walk into that room and it will be just incredibly fragrant. But the minute you turn the light on, that fragrance will dissipate. Hence the Lady of the Night. We are now in the what we call the intermediate house of the orchid collection. This is our largest greenhouse and we came out of the warm house so we're kind of going down in temperature. So most of the orchids in this house are native to Central and South America. In 1876, Mrs. Henry Blow gave the founder of the garden, Henry Shaw, his very first orchids. And he liked them so much that that was the beginning of the whole orchid collection. Then in, in the early 1920s, George Pring was sent to Columbia and he came back with over 5,000 Cattleyas. So that was what kick-started the entire orchid collection. And in 1924, they had their very first orchid show. So Cattleyas, as you can see from these large white flowers, are very showy. And so they are probably the predominant orchid of our display of orchids throughout the garden when we do display orchids. Right now the orchids are displayed in the Climatron and we change them out every week. Uh, and they also have some divisions of our species tied into the trees and on branches and tree trunks in the Climatron, which can give you an idea of how they would grow naturally in the wild. Generally, Cattleyas are very fragrant, but they're not all fragrant at the same time. It all depends on the genetic makeup of the plant. This is Ancelia Africa, native to Africa. It's considered an endangered orchid in the wild. Here at the garden, we've been doing a lot of conservation with orchids and trying to target orchids that are rare or endangered in the wild. So when we acquire an endangered orchid, of course by legal means, not by collecting. All of our orchids are given a zinc, which is what I'm holding in my hand here. And the black zincs, which are metal tags, indicate that the plant is rare and endangered. We have an extensive record keeping system here at the garden, and all our, all our plants throughout the garden are entered in our living collections management system database. Here in the orchid collection and in other areas of the garden, we put barcodes on our zincs. And if you, if you zoom in and you have a barcode reader, it'll give you all the information you need to know about that particular orchid. When it was acquired, how long we've had the plant, how many we have. And it's a valuable tool, particularly for me when I go to repot or divide an orchid. What I'm holding here is a Catacetum hybrid. Catacetum is a genus that grows in Central and South America, and in its native habitat, it goes dormant. So when we're trying to grow it in cultivation, we have to simulate that dormancy. So starting in about, in about late October, early November, I gradually decrease watering until I stop altogether. And the plant, which used to have uh, many strapping leaves on it gradually drops all its leaves and sometimes it blooms after the leaves have dropped. Uh, this plant is interesting in that in order to be pollinated the insect has to climb inside the flower and it, and it hits the pollen and the pollen winds up being jetted out of the flower and then the plant is pollinated. We've now moved into the cool orchid house. This uh, greenhouse houses orchids primarily from Australia, New Zealand, 
cloud forest orchids, orchids growing at higher elevations. Uh, what, I, what you see here around me are Papiopetalum or lady slipper orchids. These are uh, faithful bloomers. They bloom once a year, every year. They've been in the collection since 1918. Uh, back in 1915 and 1918, D.S. Brown, who lived in Kirkwood, donated his entire collection of orchids, which his collection was famous and known around the world. And he donated his collection, many of which were some of, were these papiopetalums that you see here. Most people are used to seeing orchids growing in pots or, as I showed you earlier, mounted on pieces of cork. But another way to display orchids is to tie them onto branches of Osage Orange, which is what you see here. This particular branch was just done two years ago. And it gives you an idea of how orchids would grow naturally in the wild. Osage Orange is a really, really hard wood. Uh, especially after it's dried and cured. And when we mount orchids on it, we can usually leave those orchids on there for probably anywhere from six to eight years before the wood will start to rot. It also has wonderful little fissures in the bark that the roots like to crawl into and attach to. So when we initially put the orchids on there, we tie them on with fishing line. So you really can't see the attachment at all and eventually the orchid will grow over it. This particular plant, this, this branch, has about 20 individual plants tied onto it. And eventually, probably within the next two years, they will all just grow together and it'll look like it's one continuous plant. This is something most people don't get to see unless they're actually here like you are with me in the orchid range. This goofy looking tape is marking some seed pods. This is a Calanthe terrestrial orchid that we decided we would like to have more of it and so our micropropagator Caleb pollinated it for me, self-pollinated it when it was in bloom. And now we're waiting for the seeds to ripen. We're really excited to be starting up a new laboratory so that we can once again do micropropagation, tissue culture, and various other means of propagation like we used to do many, many years ago here at the garden with the orchid collection and other collections throughout. So hopefully we will have more. We're trying to increase especially our terrestrial orchids and get more diversity into the collection that way. So that's kind of where we're starting with the micro propagation. But it'll be very exciting when we start beginning orchids from seed. We're gonna to have to be patient. It can take many, many years for an orchid to bloom from seed to blooming time. Those of you that grow orchids at home that have questions, you can always access the Kemper Center for Home Gardening. They have culture sheets. They're very knowledgeable about how to care for common orchids. And I also want to thank you all for coming with me today on this fun tour. It was fun for me to show you some of the fun different things we have growing in our orchid collection. <music>